Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, this first slide is quite important in relation to this talk, actually, because it points out I'm a sociologist, not a techie. So please, no technical questions. And if you're <coughs> technically adept, don't uh, splutter too much when I get things wrong, please. Uh, well, that's the outline I put up uh, when I started writing this uh, presentation, but I don't follow it particularly, so I will skip over that quite quickly. So first of all, what's the E for in e-research? Well, there's lots of different stories about this. The obvious thing is electronic, uh, but there's also the idea that it enhances research, it empowers researchers, it enables research. It's exciting, of course, and then my favourite one, e-bike.com, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's, one, it's lots of wonderment to about it. Um, and my talk is going to be organized around this formula, um, <coughs> which is uh, that the E is about digital technology, the technology push, plus the digital world that we now inhabit and when, within which we leave increasing digital footprints by the hour, by the minute, by the second, combined with digital natives, that's anybody who's a bit younger than me, who's grown up with this technology and therefore is very, very familiar with it in a way that I uh, can't claim to be, uh, because when I started this game there were uh, no, well, I did start working on a computer, but it was housed in a room bigger than this uh, with um, water cooling uh, and uh, very clumsy to interact with it. It had less power than a pocket calculator, probably less power than a watch, actually. Um, <clears throat> so the world's moved on a long way, even in my lifetime. But what the T stands for is that the combination of these three digitals uh, offer the opportunity or perhaps uh, entail that science will be transformed and that could be especially important for social sciences, which I'll come to right at the end. So, first of all, the technology push, some quick history, you probably fairly very familiar with this, but computers of the sort that we now understand only go back a lifetime, only started in the 40s, uh, <coughs> with the first pro, um, stored program computer uh, here at the University of Manchester. Uh, and then the silicon transistor that enabled the miniaturization didn't appear until the mid-50s, so radios until then were driven with big valves and they were generally about this big and sat on the, on, on the sideboard, uh, whereas I can remember my first transistor radio about as big as a brick, and that was thought to be absolutely marvellous because you could carry it about, though you still had to be plugged in, of course. Sputnik 1's on there, not because it's anything to do with computers, but this is generally put in the history of computers to have had a remarkable influence because the Americans couldn't believe that that land of peasants and communists had actually put up a, 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 a satellite that... that stayed up there and circulated when they didn't have the technology to do it. And so they started ARPA, has put millions and millions of dollars into ARPA because they thought their science had fallen behind that of the USSR. And that had a big impetus on uh, computing. Um, the, so a whole lot of technologies began to emerge. It wasn't really known where they were heading, but the first of those was packets switching, just the idea that you divide a message up and you send it around the network uh, to make it arrive in bits somewhere and then you put it together again. That was actually driven by the Cold War, the idea that if somebody dropped a nuclear bomb on, a, on, a, on an exchange somewhere, you'd be able to go round it, but all the other packets would go round it and still get joined up at the end. But then what came out of that is the beginning of standards because if computers, they're all independent, separate things then, and if they were going to talk to each other, you needed standards. And standards gradually emerged in the 70s, the first email wasn't standard. Only two computers had to be built so that they could communicate with the first email. And then standards were gradually introduced so that you could get remote access. I could sit at my computer built by one manufacturer or by, built by my laboratory and actually uh, get access to your uh, computer, what was on there. We get the idea of an Ethernet. Instead of one message going down one wire, we package up lots of messages and send them all down the same wire. That increases the capacity to connect up networks. We get modems. I don't think anybody talks about modems now, modulators and demodulators. This is a real breakthrough because it translates a digital si signal into an analog si signal. All the world's uh, telephone networks already there, that infrastructure is already there all over the world, were analog. And this meant that computers could now talk to each other down ordinary telephone lines instead of having to have special networks put in place for them. And I, I thought you'd like the last one. The 1980s real thing began to speed up because as we get miniaturization, or at least we get personal computers much, much smaller. They don't need a special environment within which to work. You get 
believe it or not, commercial access to the networks was only given in the 80s. Before that, they were restricted to the military and to select um, academics who were actually building the software, the standards, and the hardware. And that gave the flowering of things like bulletin boards, uh, still a bit like, we would call them forums now, I think, but they, those are, um, as people realized that you could post messages and other people would post messages back about them. And, of course, gaming took off then with uh, MUDs. Anybody here played a MUD? Uh, it seemed to disappear. They've been replaced. Uh, one or two people have been replaced. They're, they're text games. Uh, you have to type what you want to do in them. But there were hundreds of people piled into these huge muds. UK had the foresight to spend money on the, what's called the plumbing. They set up the Janet, the Joint Academic Network, actual lines connecting up all the universities in the UK, or gradually spread out to all the universities, and that gave university researchers a real advantage, although it was quickly followed by National Science Foundation Net in the US, although that was never as comprehensive as the UK one, and an EU net, again, which was quite fragmented, actually. By the 1990s, we had local area networks. Everybody begins to get their own computer on on their desk connected up to other people's computers in the same site. We move away from the idea that only computers were great big things that you had a dumb terminal to connect to, but you had your own computer power. Go first, beginning of being able to uh, search for documents on your computer as well as on my computer, and then of course the World Wide Web, which has transformed the world enormously. The idea of hypertext that everybody understands so much, probably the term hypertext has even disappeared, just being able to click on links and go to the next link. And the browsers came along to handle that, first of all Mosaic, which became network, but of course there's a lot of browsers available now. And then internet service providers appeared and began to compete, which started to drive down the cost of all of this, which was really, really important. And Google's only started in 1998. <laughs> right, 2000s, dot-com boom and bust. I mean, there was the bust, but the boom got a huge amount of effort and ideas about what we could do with this technology, all sorts of aspirations of what we might manage with it. Crazy, the bust was crazy, but the ideas were out there. There are things that get in our way now we could overcome easily if we could persuade computers to do them. Peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, more and more that I communicate directly with you rather than some authority who then communicates with you, and I start providing content. I don't just read the content that I can pull up the web, but I start delivering content up there of all different sorts. And wireless, there gets us away from having to be plugged into the network somewhere, and then wireless spreads to become very, very widespread in different forms, from Bluetooth up to mobile phone networks, and we begin to get increasing convergence in the hardware around computers and communications with personal data assistance, and then through to the iPad, is it? Through to the iPad. There's real convergence there. And then we get appearing on the scene, or at least appearing in universities, the digital natives, those people for whom all of this technology is just there and familiar, not something that's changed over the last. Give you some idea of the growth way back in 1990, right? 20 years ago, the whole of 20, there's one website, right? A year later, there were 10. But if you look at the scale, it has to quickly go up to not hundreds or thousands, but millions in order to get the growth. And then if we bring it more up to date, uh, right through to last uh, November, uh, we can see, I think that's 240 million. I'm not quite sure with how many noughts there are there. Uh, if anybody can explain that little dip at the end to me, uh, at the end, uh, they'll get a prize. I actually do know what it is now, but it was a bit of a puzzle for a while. There's actual significant dip uh, in, the, in, the 19, in 2009. So, um, we can see we are in the digital age, um, <clears throat> and a few more figures, uh, these are for the UK for 2009, 80% of adults, that's the general population, that's not academics who have merged with this stuff all the time, 80% of adults are internet users and 75% of those go online every day, households jump up in 10 years from 33% over 70%, jump up in internet access from 10% to 70% in, in, in 10 years, so it's, it's a connected world now, it's a digital age, and of course all of you, all the people coming through universities do this all the time, every day, anybody here not connected with the internet today? 
No. <laughs> um, so it's a digital age we're in. There's lots of digital out there, and just it permeates her all through lives. Look at all the different things it's used for, or was in 2009. This will have increased again by now. All of those different sorts of things are done by, by the general population, skewed upwards, of course, for, for academics. So that's the technology push that leads through to user eng- more and more user engagement, more and more requirements pull, especially from the dot-com boom on, about, oh, what can we do with this technology? E-science, as something that gets known as E-science, begins, as it were, in 2001. Now, of course, E-science had been done by all these other people since the 1940s. What they were doing is effectively using their computers to try and empower their science and improve their science. But what happened in 2001 is the UK launched an E-science program uh, by a director general of the research councils who was from Hewlett-Packard and was very IT-oriented indeed and and quite visionary in a way at the centre of government and said that science was going to change, science could change if enough money was invested in, in a push uh, um, on, on the applications of that. And so this program was launched in 2001 um, and um, the enabling infrastructure at that time was known as the grid. So people used to think of e-science as the grid. Now, if you want to find out about the grid, there's uh, the original book, 1998, 700 pages, 46 pounds. You should uh, go through that. Uh, but I warn you, when you've done that, you have to go through another one that came out in 2004 that's a bit longer, although it's better value because it's cheaper and you get a website to go with it. Uh, but I'll try and cut the need for that <coughs> in a moment. So eScience, this funding push for the eScience program, the first stage of it went to 2006. It's due to finish in 2011 at the moment, the funding. And there's a big change chunk of funding at the, at the beginning, a middle-sized bit in the middle and a rather small bit now on the sort of funding uh, has moved on to something called the digital economy, same sort of idea but we'll see broader. So 230 million, that's a lot of money to be spent on the research program um, and part of it went on a core program for generic tools but part of it went on to each of the research councils for the disciplines within their research council. The ESRC being relatively small got relatively little out of that, but 13.6 is about um, 3 or 4% of the ESRC budget, I think. That's a significant, significant amount of the ESRC budget. Roughly the same time, a little bit later, the National Science Foundation, the state, started uh, set up an office of cyber infrastructure, which is their term for e-science or, or e-research. Um, <coughs> why use a little word when you can have a big one? Uh, and that um, gathered in some budget from other offices in the NSF and began to start uh, and began a program of work, rather more um, disjointed program in the UK. And the EU has had a program called EG that keeps changing its acronym, um, and, but has had quite a lot of money spent on it, although that's, of course, distributed across a lot of countries. So the vision of eScience in 2000 and a bit, at the beginning of the uh, 2000, <coughs> uh, was the Large Hadron Collider. We've all heard about this. You know, billions spent on it and they broke it on the first day. But it's more or less repaired now and up and ready to go again. But what did this vision mean? E-science, huge amounts of data. People who talk about this, like telling you about how many um, telephone books it would take, you know, take your way to the moon, or I can't remember how far they'd take you, etc. per day or per hour or something. Huge computer power. No one computer anywhere can deal with it. You have to, you have to draw on all the supercomputers in the world basically to deal with this data and a huge number of collaborators has only got off the ground because no end of countries are involved no end of research groups so that's the that's the vision this is where e-science is it's the grid it's the hardware and the software that will coordinate and deliver over the internet huge computer and data resources and decided bigger faster more collaborative means better science that's where we're up to at the launch of the eScience program. So, we have this vision, particle physics, yes please. Weather prediction, yes please. Um, earthquake modelling, yes please. Bioinformatics, all that stuff on genetics and trying to find out uh, new drugs for uh, and, and genetic hiccups, etc., etc. Yes please, as much as we can have, we're, we're flooded out with data, we need all the computer power we can get, we need all, all the people we can get to work on this collaboratively. Social sciences and humanities, nah. Relatively small scale, even our big scale is 
Now, flea bite compared with Large Hadron Collider, very, very varied methods. Try and get even a catalogue of methods as much as methods that match up to try to do. It's really difficult because it gets bigger and bigger as you try and incorporate all the methods that they use. A few generic areas, uh, very few generic areas, and you don't need complex software to coordinate huge computing and data resources. You don't need the grid as it was being advertised at the time. So ESO science, no thanks. We've got what we need. Thank you. Computer-assisted interviewing, for example, as computers have grown up, has gone through computer-assisted telephone interviewing, where you could rely on a, one of these computers in a big air-conditioned room, etc., etc. What it fed to you was the questions on a, on a rather rudimentary screen. What it did for you was the automatic dialing. And then if that moves to computer assisted personal interviewing, move that onto laptops, suddenly becomes much more flexible, uh, although you still have to plug your laptop in in somebody's house or something, uh, but you upload and download uh, results at night when you get home uh, using your modem over your telephone line, and then that moves to computer assisted web interviewing where you deliver directly to people through a normal browser. That's a mature area, there are mature products there that will do, I think, everything you could wish. Statistical packages, well we know there, there are mature packages there, both generic ones like SPSS, although that's got lots of uh, niche bits as well, but loads of niche ones, the econometricians can pick off a package here or a package there that will do whatever sort of complicated analysis they want to do. Computer assisted qualitative data analysis, not quite so mature, still developing, but lots of packages to choose from, lots of support available. Last week we heard from Martin, social network analysis packages, I think he put up a list of four, so we've got, uh, you know, you're not restricted there, you can do what you want with those. And then when it comes to data, social scientists have always been spoiled well, for a long time now by the UK data uh, archive and then they five branches of the SDS, one of which is here in CCSR, one is in MIMAS, so two of those at Manchester. Very service-oriented, very keen to receive requirements and try and fulfill those to make data easier to get hold of and easier to manipulate, etc., etc. Then email. Co collaboration, email. We've all got email, that's fine. Search functions, humanities especially, what's transformed, the computerization that's transformed the humanities is being able to search, right? Digitally search. Instead of having to go through newspapers like I did in one project, like every day's newspaper, right, for a year, you just press a button, but you get all the stories that got that in. That's transformed the humanities, especially as as archives get digitized, more and more archives are being digitized. I don't have to spend hours in some dusty basement. All I do is sit at my computer and I find it and I can link it. I can link it as well. So search function has become immensely valuable, but it, you know, we've got all the search we want. Um, we've got uh, Google, but we've got specialist search functions too. And then my laptop's fine, thank you. It does everything I want, uh, right? And it's portable and carry it with me to lose it all at once or keep it all secure and all that. So, no, don't need it. <clears throat> so, but what happened then? That could have been the end as far as e-social science was concerned. But what happened was there's a new direction. Three drivers occurred during the e-science beginning of the, just shortly after the beginning of the e-science program. One plan, which was these research council programs tailored to the requirements of researchers. For social science, that was the ESRC's National Centre for e-social science. One evolved the grid didn't do what a lot of people wanted. And so lots of people began, lots of techies began changing what the grid was, changing the technology to meet requirements. And so that's a sort of evolution um, as, the, as the so-called middleware used to run the grid, the software was immensely complicated, immensely difficult to set up. People said, we can simplify this, we can make this easier. And then one anticip unanticipated, completely unanticipated, was Web 2.0. So those three drivers came along and changed the direction from this vision of bigger, faster, more collaborative science. E-social science, e science picks up on that, but it must be said humanities did as well, and a lot of physical sciences, there were very few physical sciences who were actually served by this bigger, faster, more collaborative. And so <clears throat> this, this, this new direction was good to everybody. So first of all, the planned new, new direction, um, the... Um, Technology push meets user requirements pull. The National Centre for E-Social Science was 10 big projects, 
called nodes with a mixture of social scientists and computer scientists. You actually got people sitting next to each other. So social scientists saying, what I'm trying to do, what I'd like to be able to do this. Technology saying, oh, is this, is this what you want? Not quite as quickly as that. But <laughs> well, sort of, but I'd, now I've seen that, it would better be it did this. And, and co-development is a fancy word used for it. A very, very close coupling of requirements and, and, and uh, construction of technology. <clears throat> there were 12 little speculative projects which sort of said, oh, wouldn't it be good if, I wonder if, um, and there was sort of a bit of a leap, but some of those worked and some didn't. And then there was also a social science of technology, social science of science and technology, or social science of innovation strung to it. What influences people's take up of technology, of innovations, their absorption, their, their, the way that they handle them? Well, let's look at that and then feed that back into the program. Having found out about that, that tells us how to disseminate the results we're getting if we want to increase any. And about 100 people involved. It doesn't seem a lot, but then 100 people talk to more people, etc., etc. So big, still having a big influence. It's running until 2012. Then the grid, the shift from the grid to the infrastructure, the second driver, the infrastructure is the whole caboodle, right? The equipment, the software, the tools, the websites, deployments, the people, the support services and the training, the whole caboodle. It's a recognition that e-science can't just be technology push. What you've got to take account of is how the technology gets embedded into research practices, how it could be embedded into research practice. No good having some brilliant piece of technology if it takes six months to learn and it doesn't fit with what I want to do. I remember the beginning of SPSS when it started to offer graphics, you couldn't export the graphics. So you could do a graphics within SPSS, but then you had to redraw it. Trace over it or something because there's no way of extracting it. So it's no good if it doesn't join up. It, you can't bet it. And then, of course, people appropriate appropriate technology to their particular needs. So you never quite know. You're designing it to do this, but actually, it gets used to do that. Mobile phones and text messaging is the example everybody gives for that. So it it moves out. It's it becomes advanced ICTs um, rather than the grid and heavyweight computing, <coughs> heavyweight software and heavyweight uh, hardware, then totally unexpectedly comes along Web 2.0. The name first appeared as the title of a commercial conference in 2004, but what's been, independent of that conference, what's been gathered under it is a certain sort of facility, helper, um, uh, that's easy to use via the browser. A Web 2.0 thing doesn't take off if you can't pick it up in five minutes or ten minutes. Right? Easy to use, a lot, of, a lot about usability, and so we have blogs, wikis, forums, social networking, blah, blah, blah. you know all about this, you do all of this, you use all of this in one way or another for your personal life, social life, and your uh, professional life and they are beginning to merge. So, those three, uh, oh, and then, of course, <laughs> in case you need reminding of some, and then if you were to think that you knew many of them, <laughs> and there are many, many more, and it is really difficult to keep track of them, and yet a lot of them are really, really useful. I perhaps ought to just mention the next stage in the, ter in the, in the technology before the iPad, but the next stage in the technology is Web, what I call 2.0+, plus, although some people are starting to call it Web 3.0, and this is from user content to user software. This is when providers, commercial providers, release, well, mostly commercial, but open source as well, release their um, APIs, their application, well, there's something interface, uh, program interface. And so users can develop applications that make use of, join up with, merge with uh, the, the commercial application. You can extend it in a way that is useful to you, you want to, um, or you think you're going to make some money out of. So Google Maps and Mashups is one of the, is one of the best. Mashups is just using two sources of data, <coughs> mashing it up so that you get something beneficial out of it. I'll come back to that later on. iPhone apps, everybody knows about, not strictly in this, but that's the sort of idea. Um, some are technologists produ producing those, but also there are lots of people around now. If you have an idea, they will turn it into to reality for you on the basis that you share the money. And of course, iPad apps after today will no doubt start flooding the market. And then finally, the bit to that cloud computing is really, it's a mixture of the grid, the power and the, uh, uh, the power and a lot of data with the Web 2.0 uh, easy to use. 
And what cloud computing is nothing more than outsourcing the difficult bits, the technology, the hardware and software. Software as a service. The idea is I want some, some tool, some software tool to do something. All I need to do is get on my browser, find it, use it. And uh, I just use it straight away and I pay in a variety of different ways through adverts or through pay as you go or whatever. The idea that it's available to me, whatever I want, whenever I want, wherever I want, it's available to me via a browser. And if that's via wireless, of course, that really provides an amazing change from just a few years ago. So these three drivers for e-science means that we now tend to talk about e-research to get away from the idea that it's bedded in the grid and heavyweight, etc. E-research, and that's where we're up to. E-research is harnessing any innovations in digital technologies and integrating them into what gets called e-infrastructure uh, generally. And all that means is it's networked, it's available across the internet or, or some local or international version. Interoperability is a big issue. It's interoperable. It's sim seamless. You can sign on once and get access. You don't have to keep signing on again with a different password. There's a lot to be more work to be done on that, but in the academic environment, uh, the rollout of Shibboleth has now made that much easier. So you notice now when you sign on and you ask for access, you're often asked which university you're at, and then you give your local username and password. And that gives you access to a whole range of things. Uh, you don't have to access those separately with their own username and password. That will, that's a lot of work being done on that, so that, the, that these things are seamless and, these, and they have the same sort of interface. That's what makes Web 2.0 stuff uh, popular. It has a very similar interface uh, to other bits. And it's scalable. You can use it if you want lots of power. You can have it if you only want a little bit. You only have a little bit. So that's it. It enables research by enabling new methods, but importantly, overcoming bits that get in the way, boring bits as well, and that sort of thing. Um, to try and the, the boring bits that you make a lot of mistakes on because they're boring, like some data preparation task, can we get that done by computer instead? Right. Technology push gave the e-science vision. That hinged on the grid, but it wasn't relevant to most scientists and certainly most social scientists. But three drivers in the beginning of the 2000, 2000s, what do we call them, noughties? <laughs> the beginning of the noughties uh, um, led to a broadening out, a much broader direction. E-science becomes e-research, which means nothing more than ICT in enabled, information and communication technology enabled. And so e-research is the combination of the three Ds, um, uh, um, <coughs> digital data, digital technology, and digital natives collaboration. It's data, it's technology, and people, and using advanced ICTs to make use of that. So, what's e-research? <laughs> what is e-research? Give me some examples, for goodness sake. <laughs> then I'll know what it is. Well, here, I'm exposed. Because it's brought down, because you're digital natives, because you're sharp and questing people, you're already using, you're already doing e-research. <clears throat> and so I can't make it entirely strange and novel. And I should add, it's not a method, which is what <laughs> uh, Martin said last week. It is just the uh, applications. So let's think about the e-research cycle, or let's think about the research cycle that's, that's facilitated, doing the various stages of research that's facilitated by using advanced technology. Now, you already use a lot of this, presumably, so there's a lot of this won't be new. So first of all, collaboration, really important, right through the, the research. Well, the baseline in academia has become email and attachments. And anything that improves on that has got to distinctively improve on it. So there's a lot of, there hasn't been a lot of advance in this area because email and attachments work so well, quite well. Uh, so distribution lists, but then people will hit the whole distribution list and send messages around. So we need something that sharpens up that. Just mail lists for subscribers. Well, if you go and look at just mail, there's hundreds of dead ones as well as lively ones. People are always starting them up and then they never take off. And how do you get new people into them? And if you want to use that as a source of communicating, how do you work it? And then really important if you're collaborating is versioning, right? I write a draft, I give it to you. You write a draft, you give it to our other collaborator. They, they add to it. 
and you send it back, and I don't know which one I've got, the one that's the final one, or the one that was an intermediate one, etc., and I don't know who's altered what. So versioning becomes very important. Of course, we probably all use track changes in Word to try and deal with that, but if you're working in a big team and there are a lot of changes, that gets very, very messy. So there's sharing Google Docs is another way of doing that online. <laughs> um, <coughs> So sharing Google Docs is one possibility. And then um, another really neat uh, facility, a Web 2.0 one, is Dropbox, uh, which is essentially somebody else's server. You uh, set up Dropbox on your machine. You set up a public um, uh, folder in there. You tell other people what's in that public folder. When they work on it, it's synchronized. Their version is synchronized with mine all the time. And indeed, they claim, well, I haven't tried this yet, you can work on it simultaneously and it will synchronize. That, you see, is just a little move forward, but is probably overcoming one of the major problems with email and attachments. So, um, then... Collaboration, well, you want people to, to, you know, the team, so social networking websites provide an opportunity for collaborating, and Facebook's so well known, got useful facilities, that it's often easier and quicker to set up a Facebook site around a project than to try and set up some other facility. Um, and indeed, uh, when I try and get my undergraduates to use um, Blackboard, I think it would be much easier just to set the course up on Facebook because Blackboard is so clunky. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there's there's social networking sites, especially for researchers at ResearchGate. That's a bit more a bit more facilities facilities. Then Sage, as you probably know, the publishers have set up Method Space, uh, which is a social networking uh, site for uh, uh, methods, uh, social research methods. Very clever move on Sage's behalf, and it's now got thousands of subscribers and quite useful forums, or fora are they, there. <coughs> and then, if you want to create your own social networking site, you can now go to Ning, and within five minutes you can set up a social networking site. It's really, you know, the usual sort of thing. Very, very quick learn to set it up. Um, usual thing, the, the free version is you have to take adverts on, there's an intermediate version you pay a little bit for, and you can pay a lot of money and have one that's tailored for your particular organisation etc etc that's a sort of example of cloud computing all the difficult bits outsourced you just depending how much you're prepared to pay you can have something tailored and delivered to you on your via your browser that's a, a, a collaborative space for my research project or my team or my department or whatever and then there's specific collaboration software called virtual research environments or virtual learning environments. Blackboard is an example of the latter. And these contain a whole set of tools. And so we've set one up at NCES um, using Sakai, which is an open source virtual environment. And the thing about here is it's a bit like Blackboard. There's a huge range of tools you can use. And you first thing you do is you go there and you say which tools I want to use. And so here, this is the list of tools that have been chosen for this particular part of that site. You can set up different subsites with different tools, etc. And the tools are there. Once you say, I want to use that tool, it's there, it works just like, you know, wiki works like any other wiki, chat room works like any other chat room, very similar. So you can get in, get in and up, run, up and running in no time whatsoever. The problem with uh, uh, VLEs and VREs is somebody has to set them up most, unless you use the Ning, the, the, the there aren't any um, that I know of, or there may well exist, but I don't know of any web service uh, VREs where you can just use it like Ning to set up a social networking site. I should also mention, if you've got computer power, you can make um, <coughs> uh, video conferencing much better, and that's known as Access Grid, uh, and that... Um, this was an access grid room until somebody stole the three projectors at that end. And it's slightly wrong because it shouldn't have screens. You project onto the whole wall and you can have as many screens on that wall as you can get in. And so you can have a meeting, a virtual meeting of ten people, each with their own screen, beamed in from a different place. Um, or you can have, as it shows here, lectures and um, the arts events and all sorts of things. And why you can do that now and you couldn't do it before is because of broadband. You can compress and stream a lot of material down the, down the wire um, uh, to, for access grid. And again, that's moving on. You used to have to have a lot of hardware uh, and uh, 
a lot of computer power, etc. Now you can buy it off the shelf a much smaller scale and you can even have it running from your, from your laptop if you've got a big enough screen. Move on then, literature review. Well, the subject topics. This is where depositories, repositories, uh, archives and search work well and the special searches like in Chute. There's Copac, which gets bigger and bigger by the week of the number of books and, and stuff it contains. So, you know, we're getting to the point where if it's been published, you can find it on Copac. Uh, articles of CTOC, which as BL has informed about all of these journals and conferences, a vast resource there for finding. Has anybody given a paper on this in the last year, well, CTOC will tell you, um, and then the JRUL begins to link all this stuff up, um, so that the Find It service is absolutely marvellous, and you can also be constructing your bibliography out of there. We mustn't forget nowadays blogs, often a team, a team of researchers will have a blog, well you can search blogs, and there are, there are blogs of blogs, and there are um, catalogues of blogs etc so you can go up various levels for keeping on top of those Google books um, I think everybody knows about huge digitization exercise uh, being mirrored by smaller scale ones by other organizations the social science citation index when I first learned to use it it was three different sets of volumes that occupied hundreds of feet of shelf and you used to have to turn pages forever to find one citation from an article well of course now it's available by the library electronically but Google Scholar in a way has made that almost redundant because you just click on citation at the bottom and you find out everybody that Google Scholar's found that has written on it um, and so on and then Wikipedia, the student's friend uh, the, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's, you contribute to it uh, and you use it and it's just absolutely amazing uh, phenomenon and then on there, keeping references well, EndNote, I hope everybody here uses EndNote or some equivalent and if you don't, you should be losing it by the end of the week it's, it's uh, free on campus it's dead easy to use and all of that bother of setting up your bibliography at the end, which you used to have to leave an hour, a, a, a day or two at the end of writing an article to sort out your bibliography when you don't need that now, you just press the button and you get it in the format for the journal that you're sending it to. Um, you can search it, you can annotate it, etc., etc. Uh, all those boxes of record cards I've got from my youth are all wasted now because because it's all up there and very easy to find. There's a web version of it, so you can access it from wherever you are. And then, of course. Don't keep them to yourself. Share them if you're annotating them. Other people will be interested to know. Um, so there's Conateer and Cite You Like, and there's several others of these where you can uh, share your references, or you you can you found something good. You can go to this site and find out what other people have said about it and what other people have looked up when they've looked at that. And it's a sort of friend of friend, you know. If you like this, you might like this sort of thing, and that's a very good way of tracing a literature. And, and then, of course, that's, uh, there's, there's tagging, uh, bookmarks and tagging as well, Delicious and uh, Digo, you've probably heard of. And another way of sharing uh, knowledge and uh, covering a field really, really quickly. We move on now, secondary data. Well, the data archive I've already mentioned and the ESDS services that go with it uh, are absolutely phenomenally good. Uh, we're really spoiled with those. <coughs> and UK national statistics is a bit mixed, but it's... Um, it, it, fairly now, it fairly often is told to sort itself out and get a bit better and make a bit more data available. So we've just had a new data uh, gateway uh, <coughs> with new, more data made available. So it's gradually becoming available. But, of course, there are archives galore, and there are increasing all the time. Everywhere, over the, all over the world, people are digitizing material from little local history societies through to major libraries. And that just makes all of this available in a way that it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't have been available without a very lot of travel money and a lot of good connections previously. Um, newspaper archive, uh, very tight um, IPR requirements on that. That was one of the big troubles with it. And then the sound archive, which is really good fun, etc., etc., etc. Depending on which areas you're working in, you will know own, your own archives and sources of secondary data. And it's always worth checking if there are more, um, <clears throat> because they are appearing all the time. Then uh, collecting data, well, quantitative online surveys, <clears throat> um, SurveyMonkey, I think everybody uses SurveyMonkey now, but there are lots of alternatives, there are lots of rivals, um, and searching on those you find specialist ones as well as uh, the generic ones. And of course SurveyMonkey does analysis as well now built into it, so you can follow the right thing right through from designing your uh, instrument 
um, <coughs> uh, um, implementing your instrument, getting your data, and analyzing your data, and presenting your data. And I mean, it's just <laughs> things that used to take weeks, months, that can be done in hours now. <coughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's still uh, expanding. And then qualitative... We have digital recording devices of all sorts now that are very, very quick. Um, I mean, you lot weren't, you lot, they're all too young to know that taking a photo meant, you know, sending off your film, getting it back a week later to find you take, hadn't taken the lens cap off, right? <laughs> None of that now. You know, you click, click, click away. You know, if you fill up your card, you can delete the ones that haven't worked, etc., etc. You can blow them up. You can, you can crop them and hold them. You can store them. You can make them accessible to other people, uh, etc. You can merge them, see so have panoramas, etc., etc. Um, so, a video, um, that little video recorder now that's specifically designed to record onto the web, like that, um, as long as you've got a USB port handy, uh, no faffing around with editing or changing file formats or whatever. Um, so, why are we limited to, you know, the old-fashioned methods of the written word or the, the, the spoken word when we can fill that out with, with, with pictures and videos? Analysis, of course, huge amounts of quantitative uh, uh, <coughs> um, analysis packages from the free to the very, very cost costly. One of the big issues there is interoperability, that I use one package and you use another package. Oh, and if I want to work with you, I've got to learn your package, or you've got to learn my package, because our packages won't talk to each other. Well, work's going on on that. There's a project called Growl, which is trying to make it so you work within your package on another package and it looks just like yours. So although you're actually using package B, you're using it from within package A and it looks, you just use the syntax in package A. And then multi-R is, R is an um, open source uh, software in which there are lots of statistical packages being written. Multi-R was a beefed up one, uh, actually a grid based one, uh, used a lot of computing power that really speeds up computation, so in um, geographically weighted regression, it speeded up a particular application from 10 days to less than an hour, <clears throat> and it means then that you can do what we like to do, you know, you try one analysis, mm, not quite work, re, 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 you know, re change it around a bit and try it again. Um, so that's beginning to happen, and one of the NCES nodes, the ESTAT node, which only started up a little while ago, has as one of its objectives is interoperability of statistical analysis packages. And then, of course, we shouldn't forget Nestar, um, <coughs> go online, uh, get hold of the data and analyze the data online, and that's, that's uh, amazing, that, and I'm surprised it, it really hasn't um, sort of spread out more. Uh, than it has, but there are some really useful things that you can analyze through Nestar, including the European Social Survey, I think. Um, and then qualitative CACDAS packages I've, already, packages I've already mentioned, you'll have heard is Atlas or used, Atlas TI and then Vivo. Disadvantage here is they're mainly about transcripts, although they can do photos and videos, um, but they, they, they don't help with audio very much. You've still got to do a lot of transcription. There's a lot of work going on there, and the um, CACTAS Support Centre at Surrey now has a National Centre of Research Methods node called Quick uh, that is uh, putting more effort into analyse uh, into developing these packages and trying to build in some uh, text mining technology to it. Uh, the NCES nodes, a couple of NCES nodes have done some work relevant there. One is the digital replay system that is really a set of windows. Whatever sort of data you've got, you can make, you can represent that data in a window, and then you can put as many windows up as you want on your screen, and you can tie them all together on a timeline, and you can drag along the timeline, and they'll all move where you're dragging to on the timeline, they'll all move to that point. Or if you click on one, all the others will come up at exactly that time. And on this example, for example, uh, this example, there's a transcript of a talk, there's a video of what was going on, which was a lot of youngsters roaming around a field uh, trying to meet up and find various resources. It was a sort of thing that you would do in an emergency situation where the emergency services were trying to respond quickly and find out where things were happening. And so they were using... <coughs> um, um, personal uh, PDAs, uh, mobile phones, they were being videoed from the edges, um, their conversations were recorded, who they were talking to were recorded, their position was recorded and their changing position, uh, and then there was some coding going on at the same time. Now all of that was being done on one screen, so you could 
you could keep an eye on how the context of what one bit of data you're working on, the context and the other multimodal data. Uh, and then analysing video is really, really difficult because it goes by too quickly and you can replay it, it goes by quickly again. So another of the uh, NCS nodes developed a markup system uh, where you had a digital pen and different users had a different colour digital pen and you could decide how thick the line was and how long the line stayed on the screen and you could tie it into, uh, you could um, have a stop start at point one second or whatever you chose and you could pick up one bit of activity and then find another bit of activity that was similar. So that was just making the task easier. Dissemination, well, present, <coughs> uh, presentation, slide share. Uh, when you've got <coughs> some quick bit of teaching to do, there's no harm going to slide share and having a quick look around to see what other people have done. Uh, this presentation didn't come from a slideshow. It's bad enough for you to realise that. Uh, <coughs> websites, um, set up a website, uh, Google Sites or Webnode is a, is a Web 2.0 site where you can go up and make a website in 15 minutes. You can make a usable website. Um, <coughs> photos, of course, you put them on Flickr and then you can cross refer to them. A video is uh, Vimeo is very high quality video. A lot of academic stuff up there. Uh, mapping is really important when we've got huge amounts of data, one way of getting a sort of intuitive grasp on it is to map it. And so MapTube is a mashup facility, uh, <coughs> enables you to, um, if you've got some georeference data, uh, to mash it up with other georeference data and then um, display it on a map. So people do all sorts of funny things like they uh, somebody took all the records of crime out of their local newspaper and then put those on the local map so they could see a map of where crime was. And that didn't require any sort of getting hold of um, confidential records or something. It was all that was in the public record. This, if you go to MapTube, there's lots of maps up there. And then London Profiler is an example of that. Here's Google of London. And uh, what you have is the opportunity to put your own uh, data in it um, if it's geographically referenced or it's already got some in that you can look at. So that puts on higher education uh, in London, the distribution of uh, participation in higher education uh, and you can look at it in uh, um, map view and satellite view and you can zoom in on it as well and then you can add another layer of data to that so tie it to social deprivation and see how they, they overlap and such like. So, the research involves no more than using advanced ICTs or the infrastructure if you want to make it sound really special to Locate, access, share, integrate, analyze, visualize, digitize data seamlessly across the internet on a hitherto unrealizable scale. <coughs> and that is my favorite definition. It facilitates collaboration across distributed teams, whether the distributed team is your person who's in the next office for you but has gone home, or whether it's a team spread out over all the world. And it enables advances that wouldn't otherwise be possible because they take too long or they're too fiddly or you can't join things up. So where does this leave social science? Because I mentioned right at the beginning, <coughs> um, it's got transformative potential, especially for the social sciences. Well, we have a huge explosion of social data. You are leaving traces of yourself at every moment, right? Your mobile phone knows where you are, right? Your bank knows where your bank card was last used, right? Your, the bus company knows where you last used a bus. The university knows where its door you last did, etc., etc. There's lots of data about you, all your transactions, where you are, the user-generated stuff you put up, and then the system-generated stuff like for mobile phone logs, etc. This is so much richer than issuing a questionnaire to a thousand people asking them what they did and what they're thinking of doing, this captures what people are doing, <coughs> what they did. So there's a real opportunity to transform social sciences. And we're not limited to social data. We can connect this up with health data, lifestyle data, medical data, all sorts of other things, economic data. And so instead of having a narrow approach to something limited to one area of data, there's the potential for really piling the data in here. Perhaps we'll begin to understand health outcomes when we can marry medical, lifestyle, environmental and social data together. Perhaps we're never going to get anywhere if we just look at one of those at a time. So, that was the T at the end of my equation.
the optimistic end, there's a ferment of innovation. There's these digital natives, there's the data, there's the technology, there's the excitement, there's, e by God, we'll be able to do something with this. Digital natives are not coming here, and the key challenges we face, the sorts of things that are pulled out by government and by research councils are migration, security, ageing population, health and well-being. Those aren't going to be solved by little tiny bits of data in one, in one discipline. So the driver's there as well. But on a bad day, <laughs> the e-science program's coming to an end, the money's running out, a lot of the software isn't going to be carried through to be usable, the Web 2.0 stuff depends on developing an income stream for it. Everybody's worried about business models. Newspapers are about to go out of business. The iPad might work out, wipe out book publishers, etc. So, it's, is it sustainable? It's, it's costing a lot of money. How is the money going to be fed into it? And how is the skills and personnel going to be fed into it to support it? It isn't just the technology. It's the training, uh, <coughs> the people, the support, etc. And so there are lots of barriers to lots of barriers and sometimes not very many incentives. You can get by doing what you are. You still get your pub papers, papers published. You still get promoted doing what you are. Why should I bother to learn any new stuff? Especially as oh, I always feel a bit uneasy dealing with this stuff because I'm not very technical. And so efforts, what they are, get dissipated. You've seen all the Web 2.0 sites, thousands of them, millions of hours put in there. They probably, most of them probably do something useful. Can we stop that just going like this and bring it together and make it bear on social problems? And we mustn't forget this. Um, <clears throat> every innovation goes through this cycle. There's a technological trigger and people get really excited. So the iPad is just there at the moment. <laughs> and then reality sets in and it's hard to use or expensive or it doesn't do what you want. And you go right down to here. You know, and that could be right down here somewhere. Oh, it's never going to help. I wasted all this money and time and I still can't do what I want. But then you begin to get more familiar. The products become more uh, mature. There's more support available. And innovation does feed into productivity at some level. But of course, how high this is, how low this goes, and where this extra productivity is, is always open to question. We never really know until we've got there. So you must always ask yourself, would it be quicker and easier to use a pencil? <laughs> you find out a bit more on the Merck site, a bit more on the M, uh, M site. Thank you. Uh, I believe this will be available on the site soon, and I'm I hope I haven't left much time for questions because I haven't got many answers, but <laughs> I'm willing to try to take any.